I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl. I appreciate you spending some time with us. As we discussed last week, we have Adam Swap here, and uh, if you'll recall, in 1979, John Singer in Marion, Utah, was uh, shot because of practicing polygamy and also taking his children out of school, which seems very interesting now that a lot of people are doing homeschooling. But we brought uh, Adam's story up through his time in the avenues, and he, his family moved when he was 12 down to uh, Fairview, Utah. And then at about age 18, he ended up going up to the compound where John Singer had been uh, shot and became part of that family, marrying uh, first Heidi, and then also three years later, his wife Charlotte. So we get us back. Uh, hi, Adam, and welcome again. Hi. <laughs> so now we say we're in uh, Marion, Utah, and you're living these years after John's. Was that an awkward time up there, a lot of tension and with his, with the activities that had gone on in his, his, uh, his situation? Was it awkward being he, there? He uh, had a farm in the middle of a hundred and, I believe, a hundred and sixty acre farm of his relatives who were all good church going, uh, modern day church uh, Mormons mm -hmm. and so you just had a little piece of that. He farm. had uh, <laughs> two and a half acres, I believe, yeah. and uh, they didn't want us there. And you know, I can understand it. We, <laughs> looking back, but they tried to uh, evict us from the place, and uh, John had made a, a verbal agreement, a covenant with his uncle uh, for the farm, and he'd worked for his uncle for like, I think it was 17 years, wow. uh, milking his cows morning and night and, and irrigating it, and he that did That was it. part of the agreement. That was I his guess, agreement yeah. to get the property, and he verbally gave it to him. And uh, after John had died, uh, the family took him to court and it actually worked against them because people came forward and said, yeah, they were there. They knew that there was that agreement. And so Vicki, his widow, ended up getting a deed for the place oh, and good. a deed to the spring, mm. which watered the place, which was actually still in the, in the neighbor's forest. But we had the... Uh, the water right, they the call water that. Rights, yeah. <clears throat> it was actually a artesian spring that had a head house and uh, that's how we got our water hmm. but yeah there was conflict um, you know in my uh, in my quest to obtain unto the highest <laughs> I was uh, quite zealous and uh, radical and uh, when I felt I was right about something, I'd go forward, head down, and 
there wasn't much humility or grace. Didn't, well, didn't I don't know what wanna, that was. But. I don't want to pass the blame, but I know that you, you rel uh, thought a lot of Brigham Young and his comments about standing up for what was right, and, right didn't you? Right. Uh, there was, uh, I lived and breathed the old teachings, and Brigham Young was all about, you know, standing up, and there wasn't much of the humility of Jesus Christ. It was about fighting and being brave and fearing not the faces of your enemies. And uh, that I tried to emulate and it, well, I, I can't say that I was always very courageous, but I would go forward and do it anyhow. Yeah. And uh, so I felt that you know, that I needed to be, I, it, it's kind of a, a determination of where you stood in your priesthood, in, in my view, um, back then, that if you were manly and could stand up, no matter what the odds were, that uh, you were magnifying your priesthood. <laughs> um, I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, it sure does. I, uh, it does for sure. But, uh, and that well, certainly explains the commitment that you had yeah. and what you were Before the grace of Christ do. came in, that was <laughs> that, that was how you judged your righteousness. And yeah. it was definitely a lot of it was a outward show, you know. It was so much of Mormonism is an outward religion. You know what I mean by that? It's how you appear. Yeah, how you dress, how you act in public. How you and, act, yeah. you know, and you can be thinking and acting and living totally different inside or behind closed doors. But, but once you're in public, you want to portray a certain right. level of pride yeah. and spirituality. Yeah. And there was a lot of pride. Yeah. I had a lot of pride in who I was and my polygamy, and uh, I didn't hide it, yeah. and I didn't care if you didn't like it or not. I thought it was the truth. I thought this is the right religion. This is, and I, I see a lot of that in the Muslims mm -hmm. today. You know, when I look at it, I see a lot of this bravado and yeah. it's a, boy, it's a false spirit. It, it has nothing to do with Christ. <laughs> it's, uh, so what happens over the next few years then? So, um, actually it was the city of Marion went up and uh, undermine our head house. And they went up about 150 feet ab above where our head house was at, and they dug down about 20 feet. And they came to a strata of rock where you could clearly see that there was a flow of water. And they put in two big collector systems, like I think they were 75 feet apiece. And they sucked all the water out. Mm. And it took our uh, took the water out of our head house about ninety percent. Oh my goodness! And that was kind of along with everything else. That was kind of the catalyst that took it to the next level. And uh, even with your water right, they were able to do that legally, yeah, or no, no. I I went to uh, there was a uh, a hearing that I brought together at, down at the church, down at the stake center, that, you know, letting them know, hey, you guys have taken our water, and, and we tried everything, and it was basically, they took it and that was it. And I thought, well, that's not it. Yeah. And I went back up, they had a taken, and there was a pipe that came out of their system that was above ours and there was this pipe running down the ditch and it was basically our water but it was running down this little creek and so I went up and got this inch and a half black ABS pipe a couple hundred feet long and I tied it into it and I ran it back into our head house and I thought well if you leave it alone we'll just call it equal and we'll go on but they took it they took it like twice and then I went up and dug a trench oh. and 
So you were really kind of battling the <coughs> well, city fathers yeah. there. And At that time, uh, I had armed myself, and a couple of sheriff's deputies came into the forest when I was doing it. And uh, they didn't want a confrontation, but it was, it was starting to snowball out of control. And uh, different elements came together. I try to think back on it, and it's like it's all kind of a dream. It's uh, that's just not who I am anymore. Yeah, I things have changed uh, so much. Yeah, but you were confronting them, and they they backed off. Is that right? At, at so, that time, they backed off, yeah. and then. In uh, 87, uh, it was different things happened. My, my little brother-in-law's got one of the people as a bus driver, and I'm not going to name any names because yeah. I, I just wish you know the best for these people up there, and, and I, I am sorry for the fear that I caused the people in the Camas Valley at the time. Um, I wish I could go back and change the past, but. So it kind of comes to a head, though. You you do shoot over the policeman. Yeah, area. I went and I saw this uh, display uh, on the way to Camas of one of the people I had thought at the time had had a hand in John's death, and there was a Halloween display. It was right around Halloween, and there was a bunch of dummies on a car, and underneath the car as if the car had hit into them. It was on their lawn. Yeah. And so I thought, I don't know. I went down that night and I spray painted on the car that this person had killed John Singer. And, and then I went to a couple other houses and spray painted on their garage door. And the next morning, everybody knew. I, I, I'd started writing letters. I think it was just one letter but I'd put a bunch of people's names on it and I'd send it to different pe to all the people I thought had had a hand in John's death. And basically it was telling them that they needed to repent or they're gonna suffer God's judgment. Some kind of a threatening letter. It too. was. Yeah. And so the sheriffs knew who it was, <laughs> you know, and they came up and the, the, the gate was closed on the property and uh, we had no trespassing signs, and they came over the top of it. And I pulled my gun on them, and I told them to, to leave. And they kept coming towards me, and so I shot over their head. And they did leave. But at that time, they went and got felony warrants. And that was right at the end of October, 1st of November of 87. So from so November and December, they tried to get me. I didn't leave the property. And uh, it, it's hard to describe the, the mindset of you get real tunnel vision. And when all, all that you know is wrapped up in you know, this fundamentalist viewpoint, you certainly feel justified. You feel you? justified, and you have these blinders on to everything else around you. And I eventually, in the first part of January, went and got dynamite. And I didn't get it, but I had it got. And I watched the church for two weeks before to make sure nobody went in there at night because I wanted... The Marion Village? Uh, Marian, yeah, the uh, Stake Center. Stake Center. And uh, made a bomb, uh, went down and 2 o'clock in the morning, set the timer for about 50 minutes and uh, blew up the church. Took a blood red spear, had John's name on it with nine hawk feathers on it that for every year that he had been dead. And, uh, and uh, basically the trail went from the log cabin down to the stake center. So, and it was basically, here I am, come get me. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, we held them off for 13 days. And uh, the final day, they uh, they sent dogs, and uh, in one of our houses that was there, we called it Grandma's house, Grandma Singer's house. They had broke in the night before. We didn't know that they were there, and the police. Yeah, we didn't know the police were there. And I had just finished milking the goat, and we're walking with our backs towards that house, and they sent two dogs and. Shots were fired from the house at the dogs, and the bullets went through the door. And um, I was shot at the time too by a sniper. But uh, an officer got killed, and that's. Uh, I just want to say uh, I'm very sorry for his death and for his widow and his children. It's a burden that I carry with me and I just, uh, I always keep him in my prayers. It took me a long time to realize all the hurt and wrong that I'd done. It was uh, years later, God got a hold of me and woke me up, but I've always felt bad about his death. Yeah. You, you want to mention the name or um, allude to it just as soon not? I, I, uh, I just want to be really careful and I don't want to mention his name okay. because I, well, don't, I don't want to, my purpose is not to bring that whole thing up. Right. Um, I just want to sh people to see what God's done in our life, you know. Yeah. And, but at the same time, I want people to also know that his death is, it is a sad thing for me and I wished it had never happened. Sure. But I think one of the things that comes out of this is this mindset of justification and I think Mormonism and that goal setting and so on is kind of adds to that mentality, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a... You, you go forward in your in your in your justification and your you don't realize it at the time but your self righteous actions because you're trying to be righteous through your actions yeah. through your self actions which is basically just self righteousness yeah and when you are able to do what you think is righteous well that's pride and so you're prideful you're self-righteous, it's everything that you're doing, and boy, it goes totally opposite to what Jesus taught in yeah. his ministry. You just so. don't see that at the time until, but you've we certainly don't. experienced these things for a reason, I guess, and um, yeah. what you went through. So you end up going through trials and... 1988, uh, uh, we went through two jury trials, and... Uh, that was very hard being away from the family and but I mean guilty of just about everything. I think every charge that was brought against us we were found guilty on but one. And was sent to prison. Uh, yeah. Went to uh started off in Florida. Uh and a long journey of prison that was uh I do want to tell tell the audience that your story and, and also Charlotte your wife's uh, stories are on sacredgroves.net and there's other of course newspaper articles and even a movie's been made right about yeah. uh, and books have been written so others you can learn more about the experience of the swap and singers uh, through your own research if you care to but but through all this, you just no question still about your fundamentalist attitude and polygamy and no, Book, of, uh, Book we, of Mormon and Joseph Smith and during the uh, just before the trial, um, uh, my attorneys came to me and uh, 
said that they had a plea bargain and uh, they would drop all the charges against me but two and I would end up doing I believe it was eight to nine years and uh, but I just had to plead guilty to two charges and at the time it was this is how I fully believe I mean this is where I stand and it didn't matter I was guilty of course but I had to pay the penalty um, and it didn't matter and I look back on it and it was like well I was being true to myself at the time sure um, so I ended up getting a 30-year sentence, basically, between the state and the feds. You didn't take the plea bargain then? Didn't and take the, it, yeah. And the trial went through. And but that was really, God knows. <laughs> God knows his children. And, and uh, boy, he's a good God. He, uh, even, you know, I saw God's grace all the way back to my childhood, even in my erroneous thinking. You could see him. He answered my prayers time and time again. Even though I knew that Jesus was just my older brother, he knew that we were going to come to him. And he knew how he was going to do it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. He knew that we were going to go through a number of hard years in prison. But I thank God for those years. Yeah. Now, your family, Heidi, ended up Heidi, divorcing uh, soon after. She divorced me shortly after I went to prison. And Charlotte stayed with me. The entire time. Yeah, stayed with me faithfully. She raised my kids. And she would bring them out to what prison I was at. She'd bring them out to Colorado. She'd go over Rabbit Ears Pass. She'd come up to Oregon. She'd load the kids up and come and see me. Wow. And she would bring uh, the three youngest, sometimes the four youngest, about twice a year. And then mom and dad would bring the, the three oldest. I was going to ask about your mom and dad. They were they there, always there. Mom and dad were and... always supportive, oh. always just yeah, they, How did he end up with the church? Is he... They're uh, they're out of the church, but still believe in Mormonism. Mm -hmm. But uh, fundamental Mormonism. Um, you mean, basically, or? yeah, Dad. Yeah, okay. it's kind of hard to pin him down on what he fully believes. But I love him with all my heart, and they're good people. Yeah, they stuck yeah, by you. That they did. Yeah, they're they're coming in the end of the and a life, and I just want to be there for them. Sure love them. Yeah. Now, this all happened in your 20s. I was, was uh, it... yeah, 26 when I went to prison and almost did 26 years in prison, about 25 and a half, so oh. almost double. Well, we're going to do another session here because of Adam's story. It's uh, so compelling, and as you get into the ex prison experience, we'll talk about that. and. Uh, a little bit, but any any other thoughts about your time there in Marion? I know you were apologizing to the people of Marion for the. Yeah, I'll tell you, I just have a heart of love for them, and and uh, I do pray for them, and I'm just sorry for what I did, you know. For, yeah. Uh, I I had the opportunity to see people that believed like I did in it, not Mormonism, but in the prison setting. And I didn't realize how ugly it was. This pride-filled self-righteousness is such an ugly spirit. And I can see myself thinking that I'm doing right, but being driven by, by an evil spirit, by wrong. It was, you just... Now, most of us that are 
grew up in the church and had that activity, we have that in our mindset. Um, we don't display it maybe or have an opportunity to be or be pushed into more aggressive actions and stuff, but we, we have that mentality of the celestial kingdom that we'd do anything for the church, um, that we have a pride went, about what we're doing. I graduated from the, the seminary program. Um, I remember one kid there telling me that if the prophet of the church told him uh, to take his own life, that he would. And I was like, that, that really stuck with me, like, if he told you to do that? And that yeah. was kind of a, a mentality, I think. Well, I don't think that's an unusual mentality, right. do you think? You know, that's a telltale sign, though, of a cult. Yeah. You know, you don't do much thinking of your own on uh, <laughs> big matters, you know, little things, yeah. But. yeah. Had you read much in the Bible at this point? Had you done much? Boy, I look back and I, I, I read the Bible. Um, before I came to Christ, um, I've got a Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great, the triple, and I have a Bible. Yeah. And in prison, you know, I'd mark them. And my, my Book of Mormon Doctrine and Covenants is so marked in notes and just yeah. wrinkled, and my Bible is like pristine. <laughs> Were you teaching your children there at yeah. the compound? Uh, well, my kids, covenants my and... kids were just babies when I left. My oldest was okay. six years old. Okay. And but during that 10 years or so between John's death and your uh, going to prison, did during that time, were you studying Book of Mormon and yeah. Doctrine and Covenants? You bet. And, and, and the fundamentalist books. Yeah. Um, got to meet a lot of different fundamentalists and kind of got into that whole culture and mindset, you know, and fully believed it. Yeah. it was, uh, well, I'm thrilled we're going to spend another episode with you uh, because now we get into the prison time and, and really what God did in your life and uh, such a joyful journey. And I know there's a lot of regret. We're almost out of time, but uh, I know there's a lot of sorrow in yeah. In the, as you look back and and you always felt like you were guilty but not wrong at, that's a, at that point, right? Right. I, w I always, I never denied anything and I, I, I got on the stand twice in the prison, and, I mean in the trials yeah. and basically told them what I did. Yeah. Well, John, Adam, thank you so much again yeah. and we'll see you on the next episode. All right. <laughs> Mormon Files. Thanks for watching.